All right. So yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Brown. I'm the uh, coordinator. I'm the webcast planning webcast coordinator um, in New Jersey, uh, New Jersey chapter plan, um, PDO. Uh, thank you for signing into this uh, webcast, the Aging Friendly Agenda. All right. Got it together. For, if you have uh, any questions during this webcast, just go to the question box, which is brought, which is um, in your uh, control panel. Uh, the planning webcast series is brought to you from is a co-op, which is sponsored by a number of chapters and divisions throughout throughout APA. As you can see here, we have a number of upcoming webcasts coming up. Uh, we have a we have an we have a CM ethics course coming in March 22nd. We also have one on technology and community building and opportunities and complete streets. Those are the next three coming up. We also offer distance education webcasts. Um, so if you go to the Utah chapter website and go into the webcast um, page, you can uh, access law and ethics credits on demand. You can follow us on Twitter. And also like us at face like us on Facebook. On Twitter, we are at Planning Webcast. To log your CM credits after this after this webinar, uh, you you can go to planning.org, um, go to CM, uh, select the activities by date, select today's date, and go to the Aging Friendly Agenda. And with that said, I'm going to introduce our um, our, our our host and panelists for today. Uh, Ramoni, Ramona Malahi. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be able to welcome you to the Aging Friendly Agenda, which is sponsored by the APA Private Practice Division. Uh, this is the website for the Private Practice Division, which is at planning.org. And I'm your moderator today, Ramona Malahi, past chair of the Private Practice Division. I think one of the big, I call it tsunami probably because I'm from Hawaii and I'm calling you for, or talking to you from Hawaii, is really the anticipation of the aging baby boomers, which started last year. Um, there's been a lot of statistics out there saying that uh, by 2030 there'll be over 70 million, over 60 by 2050 there'll be 20 percent of the population will be over 65, roughly almost 90 million people. Um, so the Divisions Council has aging and livable communities as an initiative, one of a number of initiatives and if you were to go at this website, um, address, you will find a lot of materials and resources that address Asian and livable communities. It is a living um, web pages and we're looking at creating a resource that planners could refer to as a way of being able to take a look at some of the best practices and information that is available in regards to the aging phenomenon. Um, in the next two slides, I identify some very basic resources um, that provide sort of a context of an environment in which to get statistics and a perspective about older Americans. One is the Federal Interagency Report. Another is the National Conference of State Legislatures and our Policy Institute Report, Aging in Place. Um, who the World Health Organization has done a wonderful job in regards to developing a checklist of what they call essential features of aging friendly cities. And that's really what we're focusing on today is, is taking a look at a best practice example in Philadelphia uh, based on EPA guidelines in regards to an aging friendly city. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers today. Kathy Sykes, who I find is my hero. Um, she has been a senior advisor for EPA's aging initiative for quite a while and has recently become the senior advisor for aging and sustainability in EPA's Office of Research and Development. She is really phenomenal in raising awareness uh, about the issue in regards to both the environmental health of older adults and the challenges and really taking a look at how older adults contribute as stewards to our community. And she has held a variety of health and aging policy positions in both state and federal government. 
And then our speaker after Kathy is going to be Kate Clark. She's uh, the chair of Gen Philly, which is a really wonderful multi-generational opportunity to support aging. And she's a planner at the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, where she has developed the policy portion, portion of Aid Friendly Philadelphia, which is what we're focusing on today. Um, and she has a master's degree from Syracuse University, and I'm really delighted to also welcome her today. And her colleague, Alan Glixman, Dr. Alan Glixman, who serves as the Director of Research and Evaluation for the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, and he's also an adjunct associate professor at a number of uh, universities uh, there. But his current research is of interest, which includes investigating how changes to the social and physical environments of Philadelphia's neighborhoods can maintain or improve the health and general well-being of all the citizens, but especially older adults. And another study that's also looking at how more walkable neighborhoods impact the health behaviors of older Philadelphians. Um, I'm sure that you're as excited as I am. Uh, let me welcome Kathy Sykes. Kathy? Can you hear me? You guys? Yep. OK, good. I wanted to be sure. Well, I am very excited to be here, too, and um, I really thank you for that welcome, uh, Ramona, and I'm really pleased to be with my very good colleagues from the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, Kate Clark and Alan Glixman, too. So I am now going to try to start from the beginning, my little slideshow, and here we go. So. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today. And I want to say that all of you on the phone uh, as planners are really in the driver's seat. And um, what the federal government, uh, with in the partnership that I'll be talking about with HUD and DOT and EPA, um, we, we're just out there kind of giving, you know, recommendations and uh, best pr practices. But it's really up to you guys who are making the decisions every day. So what I'm going to go over, um, and I, of course, have to start with the disclaimer that the content of this presentation does not necessarily reflect EPA policy. Uh, but what I'm going to go over today are quickly the demographics of aging, as uh, Ramona talked about, um, growth and sprawl, which I'm sure you're uh, very familiar with, principles of smart growth or sustainable communities, some of the features of age-friendly communities, our little EPA model, and then taking action. So first, I'm going to start with our uh, U.S. population with the age pyramids, and I think many of you have probably seen these before. They put the men on the left side, the women on the right-hand side, and this red bar you can see are actually the baby boomers, the largest birth cohort ever, um, you know, that came out uh, to being born after the World, World War II. And as you can see, it moves up from 2000 to the year 2040. And I can tell you the boomers that just began turning 65 in 2011 are uh, you know, going to be reaching their peak around 2030. But our population is still going to be staying very old, or almost the, what used to be called a pyramid, because it was shaped like a pyramid, is now really going to be, become a rectangle through 2050. So this is the new normal, I guess is the way to describe it. We're, uh, just beginning to see, for example, that now seven states have a median age, median age of over 40 years. And they were pretty much on the East Coast, starting with Maine, uh, Vermont, West Virginia, New Hampshire, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. And by 2030, there are going to be six states that have more than one in four residents over 65. And then we'll be moving west with that. Um, States will include Florida, Wyoming, Maine, New Hampshire, uh, uh, sorry, New Mexico, Montana, and North Dakota. Um, but that'll be the first time that there are more people over 65 than children, too. And that's partly because of the birth rate going down as well. So in the next slide, if it moves, trying to get it to move down. Let's see. Okay. I'll start talking a little bit about growth and sprawl here. Our rate of development of land has really um, outpaced our population growth. So we are consuming land uh, about twice as fast as our population has been growing. Um, and according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Inventory, developed land in the contiguous U.S. Uh, has increased by 34% between 1982 and 1997. And during that same 15-year period, the population grew by about 15%. Uh, so again, the land consumption 
um, is, it has grown more than twice the rate of population growth. And more than a quarter of all the land uh, converted from rural to urban and suburban uses since European settlement has occurred between 1982 and 1997. Again, a period of only 15 years, and that's really quite phenomenal. And this graphic really demonstrates the potential for more than 68 million additional acres of land to be developed by 2025 if current trends continue. And this, this next slide you'll see um, is showing again that uh, uh, animation is going to show that the growth trend of the urban land expansion has been outpacing population growth. And if it works, you'll see here's the population in Cuyahoga County in Ohio in 1948 of about 1.4 million people in 19. 48 to, by 2002, about 1.4 million people still. But you can see how the red is spread um, and how, if you put them side by side, how we've just been sprawling or spreading out um, over those years, uh, and even though the population hasn't uh, changed very much. OK. So what does that mean when we sprawl or when we have uh, sprawl in our communities? Well, for one thing, of course, being from the EPA, we focus on the environmental impacts that it has. Uh, from an air quality standpoint, uh, the CO2 emissions from personal vehicles have risen by about 23 percent. Emissions from trucks have risen about 80 percent. The building and transportation uh, industries together represent about two-thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions. On the waterfront, about 70 percent of water body, urban water bodies are impaired, unhealthy. And actually, dispersed development, you know, spreading out, uh, affects more area and produces almost 50 percent more wa uh, stormwater runoff than compact development. And as you probably have heard, we've got an aging um, infrastructure for our, our sewer system as well as our roads. So that's uh, a big problem. And finally, there's a loss of habitat in critical areas. The habitat destruction is one of the main factors that's threatening more than 80% of those species that are on the endangered species list. So what is smart growth? You probably know this by heart, but it's really development that is good for the economy, it's good for the community, it's good for public health, and for the environment. Now I'm going to have you start thinking about what's wrong with this picture. And I don't know if you can see, but there's a person, at least the walkway is very well visible. But that person, um, if you were imagining yourself walking with uh, a person who had a wheel, who was in a wheelchair, or was walking with a walker or a baby buggy, this would be a pretty scary place to cross from one side of the street to the other. And in many of our communities, we have big highways that go, bold, that go right down the middle of, of communities and uh, have created problems, uh, especially for people trying to go from one side to the other. And I'll quickly tell a story of in um, uh, Virginia, in Charlottesville, where there was on one side of a very busy road like this one, um, a child daycare and a grocery store. And on the other side of the street was where a lot of elders were living in housing and um, public housing. And there was uh, almost a death, an older woman like this person walking across the road here trying to get from one side to the other um, that caused people to um, say that they had to do a better job on making it uh, uh, pedestrian friendly to get from one side to the other, um, that it's not all about moving cars. So now I'm going to go uh, to another place. This is Hercules, California. And it's an intersection on Sycamore Avenue. I don't know if there's anybody from California on the line here. But here's the existing conditions. And I want you to see really quickly how um, we can make some changes. Um, with reducing the uh, width of uh, the street, so that's you know putting uh, cars on a road diet or putting streets on road diets. We've widened the sidewalks and we've also extended them, and the crosswalks now are very visible. And then in the next slide, we can see the rendering where buildings located at the sidewalks now are right up front. There's the streetscape eyes on the street. We've got uh, landscape added, so we don't have heat islands. And it becomes a pretty nice place. And it, it's great from an environmental standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a physical activity standpoint, from a social standpoint. So this is how, just how you build and how you design communities can make a huge difference in the activities or the connectivity of the community. Now we're going to look at a place in Florida. I don't know if we've got anybody from Naples. Um, but uh, here uh, we are again looking at the existing conditions in this uh, rather 
rural road with, as you can see, no sidewalks. You can see the stop sign. But now this becomes a whole different place through different, uh, by doing some landscaping with palm trees. Um, you can see the bike green, you know, the intersection. They've got a little roundabout in the middle, um, very visible for people crossing the street. And you could also do shade trees um, in this area, too, during the really hot uh, days that go on for months in Florida. So again, a little bit of paint, a little bit of landscaping can make a huge difference. And here again is actually, this is Honolulu. Uh, from. I just want to point out the left-hand turns and tell a little personal story quickly about uh, the time I visited the Atlanta Regional Commission in Atlanta, Georgia. And on my way to a charrette about building uh, a, uh, mobile or increasing mobility for elders in the Atlanta area, I was hit by a car turning left. So I will say, beware of men in cars, because men, more men are in car accidents. And it's often with the left hand turns. And as you can see, like this woman walking, um, you know, her head is facing forward. Um, we're not like owls. We don't spin around. But uh, I'll just say again that the, the people who work at the Department of Transportation, you know, have, can design safer intersections too. And you know, again, one of the major places that I think we need to do more work is on those left-hand turns. Okay, now I'm going to switch to an award program, and I'm very proud to say that uh, uh, the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging is one of our winners. And this was a, a program that we designed about six or seven years ago with colleagues from the Centers for Disease Control, the President's Council for Fitness and Sports, the National Blueprint, uh, which was a, a way to increase physical activity a plan across the nation for people 50 and older, um, Active for Life, which was a program of the um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the National Council on Aging. We now have more than 61, sorry, organizations, including the American Planning Association, who have been supporting this effort in the way of helping to get the word out about this award. And the award was really to in, uh, encourage communities to first implement smart growth principles, but also to encourage and improve um, the physical uh, activity or being active in your community through the built environment. So here we have, uh, in the past uh, years, given over a number of awards to communities all over the country. Um, and in some communities, we've even had them receive more than one award. They moved up from their commitment award to their an achievement award. Um, but you can see that uh, it's along the coast, and there's some early adopters, but other communities where you may not have expected it. For instance, Rogers, um, Arkansas had done a program. And I'll share a little bit more about uh, the Philadelphia Corporation on Aging, and I'm sure they'll do a lot more in their presentation, too. So. Now, uh, I will just say, too, that the, the programs that uh, sent in the applications came from many different parts of government. They came from the planning department. They also came from the transportation department, the parks and rec, uh, local government, the housing department, the local health department. And in some cases, it was an area agency on aging, as it was the case in uh, Philadelphia with a team of others. And in some cases, they've been at the regional level, at the council of government level. And other times, it's been a city or town. Now, here is a tool that was uh, written a few years ago with the intention of um, understanding with our growing population that you saw on those first slides that we also have a growing resource. Many, many people who have retired still want to maybe leave a legacy, want to make a difference in their community. And one area they could do it is working uh, to improve their community through encouraging uh, smart growth principles. So uh, our guidebook called Growing Smarter, Living Healthier um, really is how to get involved. And I would say that this is a tool that I hope that you will find uh, useful too. It's online, and you can also order a copy. So the first part, or the first area, um, is staying active and connected and engaged. And um, the questions that you can think about and uh, consider on changing in your community is whether or not your neighborhood has sidewalks at all. Um, are they connected? Um, can you reach uh, local parks by walking? Or does it require you getting into a car or a bus to get there? Um, is transportation located where people live that need to get around that no longer can drive? Um, are there age-friendly places 
uh, where people can gather. Um, Project for Public Space is one of the resources that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, that I have listed at the end of the presentation, you know, it talks about you know the five places. If you have five places where you can go to, it becomes a place where people want to gather. Um, so uh, here is now one of the examples in the book, which uh, the booklet has many examples from all over the country. But uh, Northgate neighborhood of Seattle um, has a new senior residence that will be connected by pathways to retail shops and the transit center. So this is a really, they've created a, they've put the housing in a place where people will be connected to other activities that they would like to do. Um, another chapter deals with development and housing. Um, uh, there are lots of different needs for people of all different incomes. The population over 65 is a very diverse one. They're not all wealthy, they're not all poor but they have very many different needs. And so um, one of the things that we always talk about in Smart Growth has to do with having plenty of housing choices. And I'll just uh, bring your attention to the um, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, um, and co-housing models. Uh, Santa Cruz has an award-winning program to increase housing choices, you know, which deal with converting garages um, or into a living unit or building new structures where either the homeowner or the person helping out uh, can live. Um, again, we've got mentioning the importance of as we develop to having the eyes on the street to make it safer. Safety is a huge factor with older adults. You know, perceived not safe uh, makes uh, a huge barrier for people getting outside. Um, obviously, too, uh, directing resources to underused properties such as brownfields. Um, and uh, preserving the agriculture or green fields is also something that all of us, uh, when surveyed by many different groups, including AARP, say this is what we'd prefer. Okay, so now I'm turning to one of my favorite organizations, Concrete Change, that um, is talking about a very important fact. A study was done uh, from the Journal of American Planning that says of all new houses built in 2000, of all the houses built, 60% will have a resident with a long-term severe mo uh, mobility impairment at some point during the lifetime of the house. Um, and it's not possible to predict in which houses disability will occur. And that is a really important message, again, for people building homes. Um, typical policy planning statements will say construct a variety of housing types appropriate for the disabled and elderly, but what we really need to be thinking about is that we have to build virtually all uh, new homes with the basic access. And what is basic access? Well, visitability. I don't know if you've heard that word before, but the basic access is something that should be in every new home. Um, and at least one zero-step entrance approached from an accessible route on a firm surface is critical. Having wide passage doors so people in wheelchairs can get through. And at least a half bath or powder room on the main floor is critical. And I don't know if you can see the woman in the red jacket. That's Eleanor um, Smith, who is the founder and CEO of um, concrete change and quite an advocate, but uh, she said, you know, it's really quite embarrassing and horrible to be um, having to use a restroom and not being able to get through the door to the bathroom and how that really does restrict um, ability to visit folks. Um, and she used uh, the analogy, which I think is so appropriate. We would never say that since only X percent of the population ever gets in a car accident, we should only put seatbelts in cars for those that might end up being in a car accident. We, we install seatbelts in every single car. So in a sense, you think of visitability as the seatbelts because we never know when we may be temporarily 